Hello. Welcome to 11 Personnel. I'm by myself. Nick Roush is on vacation, doing a little spring breaking somewhere in the SEC footprint. Not really sure where Nick is right now. I think he's in Alabama uh, with his family, hanging out in Birmingham, uh, uh, the great, great city of Birmingham, home of Eric Bledsoe. But for for now, we're just gonna um, we're just gonna talk some ball here. Just me, myself, and I. We're gonna call in Cowherd. This thing, uh, Josh Pate this thing, Andy Staples this thing, and we're just going to talk some Kentucky football uh, today. So thanks for joining us here on 11 Personnel. And we we got some questions here from our KS Board family. Thanks to everyone who responded uh, to me today. That was very much appreciated. And we're going to answer some questions. And then we're also going to get into our YouTube chat later and take some questions there live. Um, so if you're there, if you're there in the chat right now, thanks for joining. Save the questions for the end because if you put them there right now, I'm not going to – I won't get to it. So save them for the end, and we'll, I'll try to get to some rapid fire uh, here at the end. And Nick may join us, or he may not. I do not know, and so we're gonna we're gonna see. We're just we're just kind of playing this by ear here um, today. But uh, that's enough, I think, for the uh, for the intro. We're gonna jump into it right now with our Q and A. We've got about seven eight questions here uh, from the board, and we, I've combined some questions, so we're we're not stepping over each other today. Um, but first off, we're going to talk about everyone's favorite topic, uh, talent accumulation recruiting. Spring transfer portal window opens here in like less than two weeks. I believe it opens on the 15th. And so that that's like coming right down the chimney pretty, pretty quickly. And for Kentucky, I think they're going to be a potential active shopper. I think you could see the some two-way shopping. Kentucky, I have them at 86 scholarships as of right now. And I think they're probably going to lose some players, but I definitely think they're going to gain some players as well. Now, what positions uh, will they add? And that, that was really a popular question. Um, what's a position of need we may, we may grab once the portal back opens? Ask Rev Jones, 22, on the board. Um, and then SEC First asked, statistically, UK had one of the worst secondaries in the SEC last year. I think these questions go hand in hand. They've lost Andrew Phillips to the draft. But they only added Christian Story out of the portal. He's going to play safety. So what's the deal there, really? Um, and to me, it, this is interesting uh, because Kentucky did not add a cornerback in this in the winter portal window, and I think it's pretty obvious that was a massive need uh, for them. They're instead rolling the dice, and I think early in camp or at least in spring camp, Jansen Dunn's been, been one of the bigger winners here and i think he's going to play a role there he he already mentioned today he's kind of playing the andrew phillips role he's playing both inside and outside he's the favorite i think to be their starting nickel this season uh, but what happens is he going to be the starting cornerback is he going to be like andrew phillips where he's going inside outside that's to be determined i asked brad white about jq hardaway today um, and it was pretty uh, pretty much pretty much a non-answer i'm not really saying how he's doing or what's going on there with him. So I think really a cornerback, it's kind of wide open. And I think you're going to see them go out and add a guy that can potentially come in here, I think, and start. But I think one thing that's been established is Jansen Dunn's going to play, whether it's outside cornerback or slot cornerback there. And that's got an issue got to get fixed. Uh, I do wonder, like, what if you would ask, why wouldn't Kentucky just really hammer away this position and add a bunch of guys? I think you just – when you look at their roster, they – They've got 15 scholarships spent right now in the secondary room. I've got them with eight cornerbacks and seven safeties. Um, safety play was also a disappointment, I thought, but they returned Zion Childress, Jordan Lovett, Ty Bryant. And so I think they're banking on some talent development there. Add Christian Story uh, there. And then in the cornerback room, they return Jansen Dunn, Maxwell Harrison, Jordan Robinson, J.Q. Hardaway. All those guys play snap. And this year, Addison's also a guy there. And then they have three freshmen, true freshmen. So I think they're banking a little bit on their talent development there, but I do think that this is going to be a position where we see them um, address in the portal. Elsewhere, I think offensive line is obviously a spot. Uh, on Wednesday night, Anthony Crease was a junior college transfer. He committed to SMU. He, he had official visits, I believe, scheduled for Syracuse and then Kentucky coming up. So that was a guy Kentucky wanted, and he's going to SMU. He's going to play in the ACC next year. And so I think tackle is something they're definitely going to look at. 
um, here once the portal opens. I, I wouldn't even say guards out of the picture if they find a good fit there. Uh, so th definitely offensive line, I could definitely see. Definitely cornerback. And then I think the other one possibly is tailback. Um, we're going to get into this a little bit, but Jason Patterson is just in really the freshman class in general, something I'm going to touch on later. But they have been a pretty big storyline, to me at least, during spring ball. That class looks like a hit very early. And I think Patterson is going to have a role in this offense. So you add him with – Ohio State transfer Chip Trangham, obviously, and then NC State transfer Demi Sumo Karngbae is in year two. is kind of your third down back, I think, for offensive coordinator Bush Hamden. But I think running back could be something they look at there because they're pretty unproven there um, after – after well, uh, really all around, but Chip Trangham's probably played the most. But they're unproven there, but I, that, I think they like Jason Patterson. If you're running with the ones already, uh, that, that's a really good sign to me at least uh, – for, for him moving forward. And we'll move on to the next question here. Roster strength topic here. What is the current biggest strength of the roster, and where is the weakest link? This comes from Hoochie Man. Shout out Hoochie Man. Terrific, 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 terrific message board name there. I think you got to start on offense and defense. Offense, what is the biggest strength? I think this will make – some people may disagree, but on paper, wide receiver is the biggest strength on this roster. Um, Barry and Brown, Dan Key have both made plays in this league, up and down, but they have made plays in this league. Jamori Macklin was a 1,000 yards receiver in the American Athletic Conference last year. Um, that is, to me, that's the strength of the, ro the offensive roster is the wide receiver. And I think you could tag tight end, the tight end position in there with them with all, all they return. Josh Caddis, Jordan Dingle, Kamari Anderson, those are three guys that can really play um, good football, I think, in the SEC. So I would say offensively, receiver is the biggest strength. They just have some to prove, um, specifically this year. Specifically, I think Brown and Key, and I think you can even throw Macklin in this group discussion because they're, this is a draft year. This is a get-paid year for all those guys. They are draft eligible now, and I think both of them – Probably had I, I wouldn't be surprised if a goal for each was to be a three and done at Kentucky. And if that's going to happen, they need to have big gear. So you're getting uh, them in in a contract year essentially. And so I think Kentucky is hopeful that will pay off. Uh, biggest roster weakness I think on offense, quarterbacks and unknown obviously. And so we'll see how that develops. And then to me, I necessarily don't think it's tackle. Like, to me, the next spot would be, I think, guard. Like, the guard play's got to get a lot better for Kentucky this year. Um, and you hear them you hear them stressing over and over and over again the need to be able to run the football, specifically being able to run the football downhill. Now, what does that mean? I think you really have to ask yourself, what does that mean when Eric Wolford when Mark Stoops, when Bush Hamden all get in front of a podium and a mic and they say that, to me it's being able to run the ball with efficiency. To me it's being able to, first and ten, create a second and five. Stay in standard downs. To me it's down at the goal line, being able to pound that sucker into the end zone. To me it's third and two, let's run it, get three yards, and let's move the chains. Let's stay efficient with our running game. Kentucky, they when under Stoops, they've been at their best when they've had an efficient running game. And they haven't had that really the last few years. Even with Chris Rodriguez when he returned in 2022, that that efficiency wasn't there. Cre everything created was kind of created, by, I think, by Chris Rodriguez um, that year. And his efficiency numbers really dropped um, by a significant margin that year. And I don't think a lot of that was his fault. I think a lot of it was up front. And so, to me, that's, that's I think, the biggest weakness. And I think that goes hand-in-hand, hand, that running game success with inside their guard. I think they need to be better at that position. I think they added Jalen Farmer for a reason. Um, like, if you if you told me, if, if you say, Adam Luckett, I want you to predict the 22 starters opening day, week one. I think Florida, I, I would probably write down, write in Florida transfer Jalen Farmer as one of start, those starters at guard. I think they added him for a reason, and Eric Wolford was familiar with him in the past. I think they brought him in here to come and start 
at one of the guard positions next to Eli Cox. And obviously Jagger Burton's in the mix. Dylan Ray's in the mix after playing guard last year, but I get the sense they might like him at right tackle a little bit more. And then I think you look at a guy like Ben Christman recovering from an ACL. He tore that ACL in August. He's still on the recovery. The hope is to have him back for fall camp. So you see what you have with him. I think guard is a position uh, that they that they need to play better. Um, and I, that's another one I think in the portal could be a sneaky spot to add someone just because they have bodies and they have experience, but they just not they just don't have the proven production. And they're pretty young. Like Mark Nave's gonna be a true freshman. Abisell is gonna be a true freshman. Hayes Johnson, true freshman. I think all those guys are guards. Austin Ramsey's another guy, kind of like Dylan Ray's, bouncing back and forth between guard and right tackle. He's only a red shirt freshman. And so you really have Jagger Burton, you have Jalen Farmer, you have Ben Christman, Dylan Ray, and you got Paul Rodriguez in year four the program, and he's never really factored. And so how do they feel about that spot after spring ball? I, I think if they go out and get a guard, I think that tells you they don't feel very good about where they're standing um, in the interior offensive line. So that, I think, is something to watch over the next, really, two, three weeks because – once this portal window opens, it's going to go fast. It's only open for a couple weeks. Now, players can sign or commit somewhere after it closes. The window is only for you to enter. Um, but if you're going to enter, you got to enter in that two-week window. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised to do a movement there. If you see some guys maybe leave at Kentucky um, from guard and you see maybe them add guys there, um, that's a sneaky spot, I think, to watch. Defensively, I think the biggest strength I, – I kind of combine two positions here. I really think the front seven is – a Big strength for Kentucky. I, I really do. Um, Deion Walker up front, and then he's surrounded with veterans who have played a lot of football. Um, you look at Trevon Ripka, you look at Octavius Oxenstein, you look at Khalil Saunders, Keyshawn Silver, uh, Josiah Hayes. There's a lot of guys in there around him that have played a lot of football. So you start there with the defensive line, and, and Walker alone is a star. Um, then you go with his parts around him, like, like J.J. Weaver is a hard, edge-setting edge player. He's going to be an anchor against the run, and then who's maybe a little bit limited as a edge rusher, uh, but you know what you're going to get with J.J. Um, he's a good, productive SEC front seven player. You go to linebacker. Derek Jackson and Jamin Dumas Johnson, Pop Dumas Johnson, the Georgia transfer, that's going to be one of the better off-ball linebacker duos in the conference. Now, I I don't think that's probably the best. Like, you don't want them just totally pass coverage, covering, but if they're coming on blitzes and if they're fitting the run, that's they're pretty damn good. And so I, I'm excited about that group. And I'm just excited about the front seven in general. Spe specifically, like when you play in Alex Safari at kind of that hybrid Sam linebacker slash nickel and Sander downs, that's a lot, there's a lot to like, in my opinion about that group, and I think they've got depth at at, spot, at spots, too. Like, David Rainer's a solid third linebacker um, there. I'm excited about see what we see out of Tyrese Fearbury. Here is kind of a, a situational pass rusher. Um, there at Jack Linebacker, I think there's a lot to like about that group. Even some young players I'm interested to see. Ta on the defensive line, Tavian Gadsden as a redshirt freshman, uh, Gerard Smith, Brian Robinson. Uh, there's a lot to like, I think, about, about this group. Uh, Specifically in the front seven, I think Kentucky is going to give offenses some real problems with their front this year. I think that's the biggest strength on the football team. Uh, the biggest weakness or question mark, we already discussed it. I mean, it's secondary. Like, where are they at in the secondary? You know, uh, where are they at opposite Maxwell Harrison? Is safety play in general, is that going to take a big jump forward? Because the thing with me with the safety play, like we've seen Zion Childress, we've seen – Jordan Lovett play good football, but we that it kind of they took a step back last year. So you wanted to see them return to that 2022 form. But you saw Ty Bryant play well as a true freshman, so I promising future there. See what he can grow into in year two. And Christian Story as kind of your third or fourth safety, I think is a really good third or fourth safety. You've got real depth there, and you can rotate guys. Um, and if things aren't going well, like you have options there. So I think safety there, I think there's some reasons to believe that they're going to be better at safety. Um, now, corner is a whole different thing. We all know Harrison and what he is, and he's a good-looking player. He's going to be 
when we go to Dallas in July, if he's not the uh, first team All SEC cornerback, that's going to be a head scratcher. Uh, but after that, like who, what at, at the other cornerback? Jansen Dunn has really been a riser. I'm really excited to see him when they open practice and when we see him in the spring game. Like this was a guy out of Bowling Green, South Warren, in high school that was a top 200 recruit. Ohio State really, really wanted. He goes there. Doesn't go great for him. Spends two years there. Comes to Kentucky. Spends a year. Uh, kind of learns the system. And now it seems like he's ready to take a big jump. Like the profile and type of player and potential has always been there with Dunn. It's just can he put it all together? It seems like he might be doing that right now. And that would be a really, really nice development, I think, for the defense. Um, specifically, if he can play kind of two spots for you, if he can be an outside corner and, and kind of standard base defense, and if he can play nickel uh, when you need uh, that fifth, a true fifth defensive back, coverage defensive back out on the field. And so I think he would be a nice development. But after that, I mean, it's concerning. We, we don't know. Like, again, J.Q. Hardaway, it's been dead quiet on him. Jordan Robinson, you haven't heard a peep out of him uh, regarding this. Uh, Teron Nichols was a true freshman I was really excited about. You haven't heard really anything out of what's going on with him. And it's not like they're not taught that freshmen haven't come up during spring camp. They're talking about other freshmen that are doing good things, but you haven't really heard much about Nichols. So where are they at there? I think corner, I think if you're going to rank worries on the team entering the season, I think cornerback uh, is obviously up there. And then we'll move on here to our next question. Again, Jamarian Wilcox. I think some of y'all were already asking about him in the chat. This is a guy everyone really likes. Like, that was a big recruitment. Uh, we, we talked about it at length, the home run heading ability. I mean, he was a 2,000-plus yard rusher in a high classification in Georgia. Um, Clemson, Auburn, Ohio State were kind of involved with him. So, Anon, 17114597529752, ask, has anyone heard anything about Jamarian Wilcox? And the answer to that is we have heard things. He's not running with the ones. He's kind of running with the twos there with Lavelle Wright. And I think for him, a lot of it is learning the offense, like knowing what you're supposed to do. Um, he's got the explosive play potential to get it there, but I think he's a clear number four in that running back room right now. I think it's Trainum, it's DSK, and it is Jason Patterson, who's really been, to me, one of the bigger surprises um, during spring camp so far, is that he's been able to make this big of a splash. I think they like him, but Wilcox is small. And so uh, I think a big emphasis this spring has been running that ball downhill. So they want some more size there. I, that's not, That was never going to be what his big strength in college. And so I think that's just kind of where they're at. Like I think he's the fourth guy. We'll see if he can develop into kind of a situational player for them. Maybe even some guy you uh, – you know, Barry and Brown's a kick returner, but maybe you throw him back there sometimes if you need to get Brown a break uh, just, just just to try to get him on the field some. Uh, but I definitely think he's the fourth guy right now, and I think a lot of it is just, you know, getting to know the system, doing being where you're supposed to be, doing what you're supposed to do, uh, stuff of that nature, and then we'll see where he's at. Um, and then Lavelle Wright is back there too. Uh, so I, I think that's where just things stand at, running back. And I think Wilcox is that fourth. He's probably running with the twos, uh, maybe the number one back with the twos. But right now, uh, Jason Patterson is kind of – sounds like he's stealing snaps from guys in that room. Next commit, predict the next 2025 to commit. That comes from Steph's over on the board. This is a good question. Uh, now, Martell's Carter would probably be my answer as of right now because he's planning on a May announcement, and it's April 4th. So a little bit of a cop-out here for me. Um, and this is a guy we thought might commit in February. You know, he's been the number one target for Kentucky. Um, top 200 safety, Paducah Tillman. Uh, he's got all kinds of schools on him. Clemson, Oregon, Tennessee was involved. Florida's been involved. Ole Miss has been involved. Uh, even Colorado at the beginning of his recruitment had a lot of noise. And so I think, Carter, that this has been one of Vince Merrill's big, big-time Targets this year, or in this cycle, I think Kentucky's put a lot of resources in trying to get him, and I think they will end up getting Martellus Carter um, if he sticks to that May announcement. I, I think he is going to be the next guy. One I would predict. I, now, the part of the reason I'm doing, doing would predict him is because typically this 
there are there will be some commitments over the next month or so but most the big window is going to come after these official visits in june really from that time the first official visit weekend in june until really the kind of end of July, that is the big honey hole commitment. That's when a lot of guys make decisions. And a high, high volume of that comes around the 4th of July. I mean, that's kind of become the unofficial holiday, national holiday of college football recruiting is kind of that 4th of July weekend. And so a lot of, a lot of players are going to go on visits, official visits, that kind of wraps up the recruiting process, sit down with their families, make decisions, and commit before their senior football season starts and to get that done with. Uh, now, some commits, they, the recruitment still continues, obviously, and we've seen that happen a time or two with Kentucky and it, throughout the college football landscape. But a lot of decisions are going to be made. Like Spike Souls is on record saying he wants to make a decision in the summer. He's a big target. Cameron Miller, I believe, is another guy who said he wants them to decide July 4th. Jacob Polachek reported tonight that he is locked in an official visit with Kentucky. It seems like a Wisconsin versus Kentucky battle um, for the four-star receiver in New Jersey. Mark Marquise, or excuse me, Mark, yeah, Marquise Davis, top 200 tailback out of Cleveland, Ohio Heights. Kentucky has him locked in with an OV. He's got a summer announcement coming. So there's going to be a lot. A lot of guys like this, and a lot of decisions coming after these official visits. And we started to see Kentucky, the pace pick up with getting targets locked in to be on campus for those officials. And that's when the big next big commitment window is going to be. I think for Kentucky, if you can get Martellus Carter in the fold there in May before you probably have your one or two huge Juno Vs, that would be a big, big uh, development to get what, what is what would be what's probably – projected to be end up being one of your top ranked recruits in this class. I mean, that's a top 200 safety. You go through the rankings. Kentucky hasn't signed a lot of two top 200 safeties in the Mark Stoops era. That would be a big, big win, especially going into the western part of the state, which has not always been the easiest place for Kentucky um, to pull kids from or to sign kids from. So that would be a, outside of, you know, they've done a better job here in Bowling Green recently, but Paducah's pretty far out there, and you don't see Kentucky recruit out there super often. I believe the last guy they signed from Tillman was Josh Forrest. Um, so that that's a little blast from the past, early Stoops era. But I think that's where they're at uh, right now on the recruiting trail. Again, a huge June is upcoming, and we're going to have all kinds of coverage of that at KSR Plus over the next really two, two to three months as uh, recruiting starts to heat up. And then the next question comes from Hude Katz. Shout out Joe Burrow. It's regarding Kentucky's culture, have you noticed any culture improvements or means to improve those issues? Mental mistakes and personal fouls really hurt us last year. And I agree with that very, very much. Uh, the personal fouls for about, I think, a three, four game stretch there, specifically at the beginning of SEC play, were a problem. I think they got that fixed towards the end of the year, but that was an issue. For the team, and we heard Mark Stoops talk about in the preseason how this team, when adversity hit, they were not going to crumble, and that's not really what happened on the field. Uh, the Missouri game is obviously perfect, perfect example. Like they just kind of fell apart uh, in that game, and there were some other moments where that weren't great for the team um, throughout the year. So, a lot of these culture answers, you're really. <laughs> You're really not going to get the answer you want until the game start, right? I mean, anybody could say, oh, our culture's great, yada, yada, yada. But not, like a good culture, a lot of times, is a winning culture. And so you got to win games. That's what it's all about at the end of the day. But I do think it's notable that Bush Hamden has really gone out of this way, I think, three or four times now to kind of talk about how good Kentucky's culture is. And really, he's kind of highlighted just how they operate as an organization, how they practice how the atmosphere in the facility is, how, how the kids want to be there, want to spend time there. And to me, that's signs of, one, I think that's year over year, that's having the same leader, the same voice, and kind of creating this place where college kids like to be and like to go to work. And two, I think it could be a sign, and I, I think it is a sign that they got a good group there. I really do think they like that group there, and I think they like the leadership of this team. And we've heard leadership was an issue with the offense last year. 
but I think they like just where they're at, the leadership they have, the returning players they have, the old veterans they have in that football facility. I think they like where they're at from a culture standpoint. And so I think that's going to be a big um, talking point this offseason, potentially, is where they're at as a team, as a football team, as an organization. Um, but at the same time, I think Kentucky, they're very – they're. they're they're making a committed effort to kind of just lay low and go about their business right now because they know, like they this is a big year I think for the program. I think they know that. I think they know they got to go out and prove it after what we've seen the last two seasons. But I do I do get a sense that like that's to put together a locker room that's going to stick together. And to me, I think another sign of that was like stuff got really sideways for them late in the year last year. Specifically, you know, you lose that South Carolina game, a game they had really had. I wouldn't say they had no business losing, but that's a game that they needed to win. They were better than that team, and they didn't win it, and they couldn't score. Um, it was it was a really frustrating loss, I think, for Kentucky. But the fact that they were able to bounce back and beat Louisville in that kind of situation that was at stake this week, where Kentucky was in a really bad spot, and then Louisville was sky high. You know what were they? I think they were ten and one at the time. They were getting ready to go play in the ACC championship. Like they had a playoff bid potentially on the line, and Kentucky went in there and essentially knocked them out of the Orange Bowl, knocked them out of the New Year Six um, by going in there and beating them. And that started Louisville going on a three game slide. I think that was a good sign that the culture is still in a good place overall. There might have been some small issues that they had to figure out, or significant, or small to maybe minor. Uh, maybe medium level issues they had to figure out, but overall, I think that was a good sign that the culture was in a good spot. And I even think in the bowl game, even though they lost, the fact that they went out there and they put together a good game plan and they played hard and they played well, I think was a good sign about where the culture is overall. And now they just need to go and they need to win some more close games. And they, well, if they do that, they're going to have a better season. Um, but culture wise, I think they're they're in a good spot uh, right now. Now. We'll have to see what happens, right, when they get punched in the mouth when the football games start. But I think right now, uh, I think they like where they stand. And then I think Bush Hamden's comments have been really telling um, from the limited times we've get, got, gotten to speak with him so far. Now, he's only been here a couple months, um, but I, I do think uh, they're in a good spot there from a locker room culture standpoint and from a potential like player leadership standpoint. Um your best players are your. You need your leaders to be your best players. Seems like Deion Walker is a leader on this team, and he he is one of their best players. And we'll see where it comes from on offense. But I think him and Harrison stand out to me as kind of leaders for this team, and they're two of your best players. So that that's going to give you, I think, a really good chance to have a good team because of when you have that. Then the next question is about the Kill Shorts Jr., um, the wide receivers coach. A new wide receivers coach came over from Houston. Um, Cam underscore Taylor on the board asked. Or points out, I like the buzz coming out of the receiver room. Did Stutes finally nail the hire for receivers coach, or is the competition level amongst the group showing itself? Iron sharpening iron. I think with shorts, the the early returns for him have been really, really good. We've talked about on the board. We've got some intel for people and sources inside the program who speak very highly of him, how he's been able to relate to players, uh, he's really made a quick splash on the recruiting trail. We just mentioned um, the receiver up in New Jersey, uh, name escaping me right now, uh, Cameron Miller. Like He's got Kentucky in a great position for them. I think he's going to be a real threat for the Wildcats. They're in the mid-Atlantic area. And so that, number one, is important. Like They add, add another recruiter on that offensive staff, a guy who can really go out and get you players, I think is a big deal. Um, and so he's given them that. But I also think in the room, it seems like he's really relating to the players. I think the fact that he played the position uh, was important, and I think it's helped some of those guys in there. And I think they needed to hear a new voice, and I think that that, that seemed like a good development, I think, for them. Now, you bet the track record has not been great, receivers coach. You know, they've had a lot of heavy turnover. I mean, you go Tommy Maynard. Then I believe you went uh, Lamar Thomas. Then I believe you went Michael Smith. Then J Jovan Boonight. And then Scott Woodward. And now the Kill Shorts. And a lot of those guys are out of college football now. 
the guys that coach receivers uh, for Kentucky. Well, Woodward took a head coaching job in high school. I uh, do, do you believe Lamar Thomas is out of football. I believe Tommy Maynard. I believe Tommy Maynard may be back high school coaching. Uh, and then I believe Boo Knight just got fired at Marshall. I didn't know if he landed a job yet or not. So the track, the, like they've had some misses there. Wide receiver coach, where Schwartz is a young twenty six year old is a high riser right now. And, but he's been worked for he's only worked for Dana Holgerson. So it, to me, from that aspect, it was a little bit of a gamble. But early returns have been really, really uh, strong um, regarding him, and he's got a again like we just talked about that on paper talent wise, that receiver room looks like Kentucky's best positional unit, and they need that group to be good, and they need them to be more than good. They need them to be consistent and dependable week in and week out, snap in and snap out, uh, and they need to kill shorts to really guide that room and get the best out of that group. Uh, Kentucky made a concerted effort, I think, to get older and get some guys with that with strong work ethics out of the portal, and I think that's why they added both Jamori Macklin, a guy who's grinded, right, had, leaves Missouri, goes to North Texas, grinds there for two years, has a big year, and now he's looking for a big season at a higher level. And then Fred Ferrier didn't really have a lot of options out of high school, had grinded at UAB, and now they give him a chance to come play here. Like I think those additions were made, were calculated. I think they were really looking for um, dudes who love football and who are going to come in here and grind and work. And I think add to to supplement them with Dane Key, Barry, and Brown into big seasons. I think there's plenty to get excited about, and the depth's obviously improved. Uh, but they got to go out and do it, and they got to you got to see seven and six make plays week in and week out, and you got to see the quarterback get on the football too. And so I think, uh, I think this had this hire seems early. It has a chance to break that wheel and be a really good, like potentially a. We could look back in five years and be like, "Wow, that was a really good hire by Stoops, hiring to kill shorts." And I, I think early returns. He's making an impact as a recruiter. He's making an impact in that room as a coach. And so I cautiously, maybe a little bit more than cautiously, optimistic that shorts is going to be a really, really good ad uh, for the Wildcats. Um, and the last one, and we'll get to the chat here soon, um, regarding QB buzz. Feels like there has not been a lot of QB talk this spring. Is there a concerted effort on that after Leary got crazy offseason hype only to sorely disappoint during the season? Or is it truly not much to talk about? Everyone looks like what we would, would expect. This comes from ZimZam24 on the board. Yeah, I think I have kind of a two-part answer to this. One, I think Brock Vandegrift was a big-time recruit. Lincoln Riley recruited him. He goes to Georgia. You know, he he didn't start because they had Stetson Bennett, and then Carson Beck's going to be a first-round pick in the 2025 NFL draft. And so, like, it's not like there was – they just had dudes over there in Georgia. So he didn't start there, but he still got to go out and prove it. Um, he's got a very intriguing skill set. And then we heard Brad White talk today about – um, just his dual threat, his dual threat ability is real, and it's going to be challenging um, for, for defenses to try to handle. And I think that also that's a sign that, hey, Bush Hand is going to run the quarterback, and he's talked about that to us in his introductory press conference, and maybe he's done it uh, at places. And so that that's going to be an element for Kentucky's offense, and I think that's exciting. Um, it's definitely going to be something that will help them. Um, on the field this year. But I think that's part of it. Like, he's got to go out and prove it. This, this is not a situation where they had Devin Leary or had a year with Will Levis where the, you had real tangible results to be like to point to and say, this guy's done it. We're excited. Let's go do it. And then the second part to that, I do believe that two offseason in a row, the, the hype around the quarterback position was, was kind of crazy. I mean, you talked – both Levis and Leary going into the season, if you just read some of the buzz coming out, you would have thought that these guys are going to be like maybe potential Heisman guys. And that never developed for either of them. And Leary was very up and down. And we, we talked about that, whether his fit was this or that, yada, yada, yada. So I get the sense that Kentucky is kind of wanting to just put their head down and, and Mark Fru Stoops' favorite phrase, just go to work and just get back to their identity and who they are and maybe trying to stay out of the limelight a little bit this offseason. I mean, it's been pretty quiet 
over there outside of the when we got the portal bump. It's been fairly quiet after the ball game until spring ball started. And then even in spring practice, it, outside of some of the freshmen they've praised, they're really kind of hesitant on getting too ahead of themselves. And I think believe Brock Vandergriff, they just want to take it slow with him. Um, Vandergriff had a tough change here already in his Kentucky career. <laughs> he was studying the Cohen, you know, getting Cohen ready to play for Cohen really for two, two and a half months. And then they pull the rug out from under me. He's got to learn a new system and learn, get to know a new coordinator. And then in two weeks, you're out on the practice field with him. And so there's, he's got a lot going on. Um, it's drink, drink of water out of a garden hose right now. Um, so they want him to just to kind of take things slow and progressively stack days. But I think they're, you hear them talk about them once it gets going. You can, you can hear that just the, the talent he has. And if he can just put it together, they can really do something. And it's going to be on a more modern offense. They're going to mix in some tempos. Again, it's not going to be a NASCAR offense, but they're going to mix in some tempos and they're going to run the quarterback. Uh, Brock Vandergriff is not a run first quarterback, but they're going to have zone read and he's going to pull that ball sometimes. And he's going to run QB draws. And they're probably going to have a QB power, a QB counter sprinkled in at some point as a wrinkle uh, later in the year. And so I think, there's reasons to get excited, but I think Kentucky, I really just think they're making a concerted effort to just um, stay low, go about their work, and then go out and, and improve a year and try to stay motivated under the, uh, under the radar and go out and prove prove people wrong this year. And so I think where that's where they're at. And before we get into some chat questions, I just wanted to talk about um, some of the spring intel we have, what we know about Kentucky at the halfway point. We wrote about this at KSR Plus earlier this week. Again, like this, this freshman class is, I'm, I'm, I think we should all be high on it at this point. Uh, it's early, but Jason Patterson pushing for the ones is, I think, a sign that he's going to be a player. They are talking about Harley Gilmore, like he is the next, next absolute All SEC, all potential All American dude at receiver. Um, like he, Brad, even the defensive guys are gushing about Gilmore, and so I don't. This kid is should be a senior in high school or junior in high school right now. I believe he just turned 17 years old. So I, I'm not expecting him to make a huge push or huge splash as a, on the field this year. But by stock, because in the future, like this is a real guy that I think they believe can be a building block. And then Brian Robinson and Gerard Smith are getting a ton of reps on the defensive line and could be rotational players. I think there's a lot to like about that group, and only half of them are here right now. There's some more um, coming later this summer. Um, Injuries along the defensive front are, are eating them up right now. They're a little thin. Darian Henry Young is still recovering from a torn ACL injury he had against Mississippi State. Kendrick Gilbert has not been allowed to hit. He's not been cleared from injury. They haven't gone on record and said anything about Deion Walker, but I get the sense that they're they're taking it slow with him and they're not really involving him very much in spring. We'll have to see if they if they uh, let him go in the spring game, but it seems like a guy that they're just taking it slow with him. Um, you can't really blame them. On that, on that aspect. And then, um, again, the offensive line mindset has not changed. They're determined to get this run game fixed, and we'll see how that plays out. And then Bush Hamden's, like, the tempo, it, it sounds like they are legitimately messing with tempo and going fast out of, out of the huddle and not in the huddling. Again, I don't think they're going to be full-on NASCAR pace, but I do think they're going to sprinkle in more, kind of get the line, snap the ball quicker. And – not huddling at all and getting the play call in fast. And I think that is going to be a big thing for them. And so and the, the early returns on him have been positive regarding that. Now we'll see what it looks like once the game starts. But long, gone are the days, I think, of breaking the huddle with 10 seconds. Um, they're going to be lined up with 20 seconds and then to be ready to get the snap off once they hit that 10 clock instead of not being ready to snap the ball when, until the clock hits – under three. And so I think that alone is going to allow them potentially to get more plays in. And then, of course, 11 personnel is always brought to you by Monticello Bank. Been in business for 128 years because Monticello Bank is where people matter. With 21 branches in 14 counties across the Commonwealth, visit one of their convenient locations, locations or see how Monticello Bank can finance your future at NBCBank.com. Again, if you need a home loan, any type of loan, or just need to talk talk to them about what your financial stand, just go and visit one of those 
locations, Monticello Bank. They're a friend of the program, and they're a friend of your, you. So go check them out at Monticello Bank. And 11 Personnel is also a proud partner of FanDuel Sportsbook. You got the Final Four coming up. You got the Masters coming up. Baseball is off and running. The Reds are off to a good start here. And they got a series coming up with the Mets at home starting on Friday. Um, it's America's number one sports betting app. It's FanDuel. Online sports betting is now live in Kentucky. New customer get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. At $200, if your ticket cashes, head to FanDuel personnel sign up today. To, you can bet the under this weekend with the Final Four. You can bet Zach Eady props. There's all kind of player props. And this might be the end of player props for college. There's some movement that that might change. So if you want to get on the props, the Final Four in college ball might be your last opportunity here. So DJ Burns, you want to maybe par parlay some props with him, check it out at FanDuel. They got all everything you want to need or maybe want to look at um, this weekend. Must be 21 plus and President KY. First online real money wager bonus issue non with drawable bonus bets which expire seven days after receipt restrictions apply see terms at sportsbook.fandle.com gambling problem call 1-800-GAMBLER and with that said chat people i am here and we're going to get to the chat and take some questions right now so go ahead and fire those off and i'll look to get to some okay and we'll start i'll scroll up a little bit but start firing them right now i'm going to get to these as much as as many as possible um but we'll see all right just had to load that feed right quick um jimmy asked lucky can you explain for those who don't know me how much seven extra plays actually can make a difference a complimentary football right want we'll to keep your defense off the field Seven plays for your offense may take away seven plays for your defense. Um, so ball control, if you want to be a ball control offense, that matters. So it could be three extra first downs. Where those first downs come in a game, you know, you can extend the clock. You can potentially take away a whole possession from a, de a defense if you can do that. So if you want to shrink a game, it, it helps you there. Um, if you get behind, you need extra plays. So being able – if you're down – 21 to 13 into the third quarter, you're going to need more plays. So if you're able to snap it faster, that's going to give you more essentially swings at the plate. So they can make they can make a big deal. Seven plays, that's a lot of times that's a maybe a possession or even possession and change. So that's an extra possession there on offense. So that makes a big, big difference. Uh, UK average 54.9. Yeah, that was Jimmy right there. Uh, BDIY regarding defense was last year an anomaly or did the scheme get exposed? How do we get more consistent QB pressure and more consistent pass coverage? BDIY asking that here. I think that is a great question. I, I really, really do. I, I'm not sure the answer to that. I think that it seemed like there was some of UK getting got last year scheme wise. Now, was that a personnel issue, or was that that teams had them figured out? Uh, I don't know. I think it's a fair thing to wonder. Uh, I think a big part of the defensive struggles to me last year, I think safety play was supposed to be a strength and ended up being a weakness, and that that was a problem. I think they had a hard time overcoming when that when that happened, uh, when that and injuries had an, a major effect there. Jalen Geiger was banged up for most of the season. Jordan Lovett was banged up, missed some games. I mean, they were in a situation where Ty Bryant was playing as a true freshman, uh, and that was a guy they asked a gray shirt. Um, I don't that I don't think that was in the cards for him to come in and play. And I think he did a pretty good job, but they need that group um, to be better because I think they put a lot on those safeties back there. And I think any zone coverage, heavy zone team, puts a lot on their safeties, um, and so they're going to need that group to be better. So I think that was. An issue, and then I know the popular question is the QB pressure or consistent pass coverage, but specifically get the, the pressure rates. I think look, you look at this. Deion Walker had one of the highest pressure numbers in the SEC. Like he's one of the best pass rushers in the conference. He's going to be one of the probably the best pass rushers in the country. Where Kentucky really needs, I think, to improve is kind of the the edge, the edge rush. They really haven't had a bendy, true bender edge rusher since Josh Allen. Uh, and I'm not even saying they need a Josh Allen, but they just need somebody who can bend the corner um, and can speed rush and get to the quarterback. I think what we saw from Tyrese Fearbury, specifically against Clemson, uh, 
at least for me, that perked my ears up. Uh, because we haven't, I haven't seen a guy with a get off and burst like that since Allen from just a speed rush, being able to dip his shoulder to turn the corner, and then he he really popped to me. And so if he can give you that and can be a real threat there as an edge rusher, it changes a lot of things. Specifically with Kentucky's run defense, where if you're stopping the run and you're creating advantageous or with pass heavy downs, where quarterbacks are going to have to drop back. You need to be able to your – your pressure needs to be able to get there. Your line needs to be able to get there. Walker can get there. Um, but every offense they play is going to be like, we cannot let zero destroy destroy us. And that's going to create advantageous situations for other players. I think you saw at times Kentucky's defense line got some sacks because of Walker. Um, I think even the bowl game he caused a couple. But I think Fearby, he's going to get some one-on-ones, and I think he's going to have a chance to win and record some big individual wins and high leverage downs in games this year. And I think you have to hope he can he can kind of provide that. And a lot of that, to me, it kind of goes to recruiting. Are you getting guys that can rush the passer? Um, I don't know if Kentucky was always getting those. Um, I think that's a little bit changing. I think Gerard Smith's got a chance um, to be a pass rusher. Brian Robinson, I, he's not necessarily the bendy athlete, but he's a power player, and he's going to be able to run through guys and hold blocks and get off blocks. Um, and there's value in that. But you got to get guys who, who can provide some athletic juice and get to the passer. And so I think fixing the fixing that pass rush uh, is really important. But I think there's some signs there that it could be good this year. Let's see here. What about Grant Goffrey? As common sense, his dad played for Tennessee Titans back in the day. His brother's on Clemson's basketball team right now. Um, was nearly in the Final Four. Um, he was coming off an injury last year. He's at linebacker right now, off-ball linebacker. He's probably linebacker four, I would say. In that room, he's an important one this year. I would look: is he does he get in like a rotation role? If he does, he's going to be a big part of the future, and he's going to be a starting linebacker next year. So I think he's in a good spot. He had an injury last year. I liked him as a prospect coming out um, of Georgia um, there in the twenty twenty three class. So definitely liked him. Let's see here. This is from a uh, friend of the program, Chaka Cummings. What is the buzz around outgoing transfers? Which room should we expect to get hit? in the spring window? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I think offensive line in general, that's obviously one of your bigger number groups. So just from a number standpoint, Kentucky's got 15 scholarship linemen right now. I think you could see potentially maybe a guy or two from that group bouncing. The receivers got 11 scholarship transfers. There's only so many snaps to go around, so that's one I would watch. Running back is another one. Um, I think we, you could maybe see lose a guy. And then elsewhere, I think like there is a logjam kind of at linebacker with all these freshmen they just signed. You know, Quintavian Norman, surprise signing. Antoine Smith's in for spring right now. Devin Smith's going to arrive. was a big recruiting win for them in Brunswick, Georgia. Um, Jaden Smith was a surprise recruiting win because of the, the Michigan coaching change. And then Steven Souls is another one who's on campus right now. So does that maybe cause someone to leave that maybe is a little bit older than them? That's something I think to watch – to look for and to watch out for. And then at corners, another one. And like if they bring in a corner a transfer, like if there's maybe a guy or two I think could potentially look to leave there, especially if they they don't have a starting spot coming out, a spring camp, and then they bring in a transfer corner, that could be one where you see some movement there. And then also I think one to watch out for, like they have four specialists on scholarship. Only two of them can kick. In a, in a game, essentially, unless you're going to have a third as a kickoff specialist. Alex Rainer's the starting kicker. Wilson Berry's the starting punter. I wouldn't be surprised if they look at punter there. Um, and then Jacob Callaway is a guy, I think, or Cowie, excuse me, is a guy they're excited about. So I, I don't think he's going to be one, but maybe a specialist, if something happens there, I wouldn't be surprised if there's some movement uh, there. So that would be, that's your transfer portal report here from 11 personnel. Okay, let's go. Let's fix. Let's fix another one. Let's see here. Uh, let's see. Nazra Breeze, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Do you think teams like Tennessee will adjust to the new helmet technology and move quicker? Also, how will you will he adapt against Tennessee speed? That's a really good question. Tennessee can't. I don't think they can go any faster. So, I... I don't think so, 
But um, it could maybe be a thing where they're the same personnel and same grouping. Josh Heupel can say a word like uh, purple pencil, and that can mean something. And they can go maybe – maybe they could get on the line faster. But they're already going so fast. I don't know how much faster they can get. I think who it's really going to help is kind of huddle operations, really. I really do. I think for Kentucky, even if they would have stayed in the huddle, I think we would have seen their pace get better just because they were just going to get – there was no, like – looking at the band, reading the band. It's hearing it and relaying it. I think that would have helped them, uh, potentially. And I think even Kentucky, where they're going to be kind of a check with me operation, you know, you get to the line, stop, look to the sideline after the defense gets set. Those check with me operations are going to help. Instead of looking at the signals or the, the big cards over there on the sideline, they're going to be able to, uh, to uh, just, you know, hey, we're running – a, B, C, one, two, three, on 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 double hut. You know, that, I think that's gonna that's where you're gonna see the real big impact. Um, there is some of those operations, and then only that, especially if you get to line, if you get the line early and get set, um, if the offensive coordinator can kind of see where they're at, he can kind of help the quarterback where to look. And so I think that's where it will really help Tennessee. Uh, I mean, it could help, but I don't. I just don't know if they could go any faster than I mean, they're going. And then how? Kentucky adapt against Tennessee speed? I think that's a great question. I, I, that's something that has given them, Kentucky, a lot of problems. Uh, and that's something they're going to have to figure out, I think. You know, anytime you play Tennessee, it's about if you can if you can hold up in the, when they're light box. Well, you have to play a light box because they're spread out so much. But if you can physically win and dominate matchups inside there, you make it really hard on them, and then you make them make a lot of low percentage throws that Hendon Hooker made high percent made look high percentage. But but if you can't do that, then they can play action you, and they can get guys behind you. Um, so for me, I think it's a lot of can you stop can you stop their stop that run game with a light box? Kentucky struggled to do that. Um, even this past year, I thought they would fare a little better, uh, and they still had issues stopping the run. I mean, just go look at the end of the game; they had a chance to get a stop and go win the game, and they just couldn't stop. I mean, they couldn't stop the run game. And then Hypo mixed in some design Q run there, and they just had a real real problem with it. And so I think that's uh, that's something they're going to have to get better at. But I think it's, you know, you got to play complimentary football uh, there too. And, like, your offense has to help help you out uh, there. And that's kind of goes back to the, the extra possession. Like, if you can play keep away and you can maximize drives, you can – you're gonna have a better chance, but uh, it's tough. That that's been a tough matchup for Kentucky. On you know, I think it's unfortunate for a lot of people that it's kind of worked out the way it has. But Kentucky's had two games with them that went down the wire. Um, Tennessee found a way to win them late, and then of course uh, they got way away from them there in 2022. But uh, we'll see what what happens this year. But that's something they're definitely gotta figure out. Um, let's see, Pig, Spig 76. Kamari Anderson is a player I am interested to see how he's developed. He was a defensive end. Would be awesome to see him pass rushing as he looks bending and explosive as a tight end. Kamari Anderson is where he needs to be. He's going, he has the look of an NFL tight end and could be a special player for Kentucky. So I think Kentucky's happy with where uh, Kamari is entering his sophomore year. Um, I think he'll play a big role this year. And I think, like, you go back and watch that Louisville game. He had that on a third and nine, I think. He had a catch and hurdle, and he moved the chains on what ended up being a touchdown drive for Kentucky when they were kind of reeling a little bit early in that game. Like, that was a big play from him, and he's going to play a big role for the Wildcats this year. He's a player I think you should be excited about. And then Garen Beckett asked, are we going to see Anthony Brown Stevens get some good playing time? I think, yeah. I definitely think he is probably wide receiver four uh, behind Brown, Key, Macklin. And he's getting wide receiver three reps this year, uh, or excuse me, this spring because Macklin's been out. He's kind of, I think, they're a true slot guy that they're going to use. So I definitely think he's going to get reps. And I think when you look at the snap counts and at the end of the year, I think he could definitely be third or fourth um, in receiver snap counts there. And we'll get to a couple more here before we get out of here, guys. Scott Gregory asks, I rewatched the U of L game and the number of newly banned all weight tackles exceeded double figures. How long did it take to 
fan for effects CBS. I guess you're talking about the hip drop tackle there, Scott. Um, I'm not really sure. Uh, so correct me if I'm wrong. That just banned in the NFL. I think it's a college. We'll see how that goes. And then they might consider it making a personal foul. Uh, but that's kind of TBD. That's not something they will they will get to anytime soon. BDIY also asks, hey guys, what is one potential new offensive strength we can expect under Bush Hamden? And what is a potential new liability? Uh, the one thing that really stands out, I think, about Hamden is they've always been able to run the football. Every one of his offenses have found a way to run the football. So I think that like it's gonna be a strength. I think one of these Kentucky backs is gonna have a potentially it's gonna rise up and have a big season, and they're going to be able to run the football. And I think they've made a concerted effort to be able to run the football better this year. And so I definitely think that could, that's going to be a strength. Potential new liability? I, you know, I don't know, because I think Landon's strengths kind of align with Kentucky's program strengths, and the big liability has always been the passing game. And so can they fix that? And we'll see what Hamden can do. And so I think that's a big question with them. Can you know, he developed and built a really good passing game. Um, that's kind of, I think, TBD. Uh, but he's already proven that he can build a bare, bare minimum competent to good ones um, that can produce 3,000-yard passers. So that's exciting. Um, and I even think at Boise State last year, it's hard to even really evaluate him as a passer because um, Taylor Green was his quarterback, but Taylor Green had some – he was not the most natural passer, I would say. He was definitely kind of a run-first guy who was – they're trying to develop – as a passer, and he's at Arkansas now, and it sounds like he's going to be Bobby Petrino starting quarterback. Uh, and I, so I'm interested to see how that works out because he had some issues throwing the football um, last year. And so I think there was a situation where they just maybe a little hamstrung. He was a little hamstrung with that passing game situation. So I'm interested to see him with a guy like Vandergriff, who's maybe a little more polished. All right, guys. I, I think that will just about – do that here. Okay, we'll do one more, Matt Chumley. We should be able to simulate Tennessee speed a lot better. Um, and then, a, let's see here. It's still hard, but it helps have guys that have played against that too. I agree with that, Matt. Um, and I think we'll go ahead and wrap that up here. Again, guys, thanks for doing that. We we'll, should get Mr. Roush um, back next week. I appreciate all of you guys who sent, submitted questions, whether on the board or here in the chat. Uh, again, we got... We've got some more spring coverage coming this way. They, Kentucky should be opening a practice for the media, so we'll have a lot um, coming from that. So stay tuned for that. And then we got the spring game next week. Um, so keep your fingers crossed we can get some good weather, get some tailgate beers out in the parking lot uh, for your fine football folks, and go on, go in the stadium and watch some football and get to see some of these new guys. You know, Get to see Bush Hamden, get to see Brock Vandegrift, get to see Pop Dumas Johnson, get to see some of these guys out on the field. Uh, so we're getting excited about it, and we're getting an inch closer to the season, and we've got a – jam-packed summer coming got plenty of content plenty of coverage team coverage both recruiting and what's going on with the current roster over at ksr plus things are going to pop off with the portal again and that goes right into um, the peak summer recruiting month and that gets us right into the season uh, so come out come over and join us it's going to be a fun ride uh, and i think that'll just about do us so uh, go cats go croaker